morning the gospel text is taken from uh, St. Matthew chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. Jesus entered the temple courts and, while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they asked, and who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven? or from men. They discussed it among themselves and said, well, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, we are afraid of the people, for they all hold that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. Then he said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show to you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. This the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated we go into the text today. A little background uh, to this um, particular chapter and verse that we read today. Um, this interaction between Jesus and the, the authority, the temple authority personnel uh, took place um, during that week before his death. So it was the later part of his ministry. And uh, if you remember um, later in the week, um, is when they eventually uh, were able to politically maneuver things and, and execute Jesus. But during that one week period, uh, this little interaction, verse 23 through 32, took place. And it was such an impactful um, interaction that uh, Matthew remembered it and took note of it and uh, put it into his gospel. So it, it comes after... The whole chapter is, is, is profound, but, it, but it, uh, it comes after Jesus first clears the temple, if you remember that incident. He goes and upturns the, the various um, tables that uh, were put in place regarding um, business transactions. And then there was this weird little story, and I'm just going to get to it because it's... It, it's kind of sticks in your head right before verse 23. Early in the morning as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he's going back to Jerusalem, uh, he's hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, if you have faith, confidence, and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. And then this morning is where we pick up from there. Let's pray as we go into the text. Jesus, thank you for, for not only calling us, but continuing to guide us in our lives and to reveal more and more the depth and the, the, the richness of your presence and the truth of your teaching, your kingdom. May we, as we continue to follow you and to learn from you, uh, be transformed into your very likeness and discover the truth that as we minister in your name and live in your kingdom, 
that we also live from that limitless, endless glory and beauty and creativity and power that's in your name. And this we pray in your name. Amen. So authority. Authority is a real um, touchy issue with Jesus. It's a, something that we have to deal with on a, on a regular basis uh, in our lives in many different ways. Um, so most, of the, most of the authority we uh, either yield to in order to um, get what the authority uh, has for us. For example, if, you, if your car breaks down, you want somebody that knows what they're doing, that they have authority to work on your car. And we get authority different ways. If you're new to the area, you move into the, to, to the area and you say, well, you know what, my, my, my car broke down. Probably the first thing that you do is if you know anybody in the area, hey, do you, you know of a good mechanic? Word of mouth. Because advertising can give you somewhat of an idea, but uh, have you ever been fooled by advertising? Yeah, you learn not to trust that. So, yeah, yeah, well, who's that? Well, yeah, this guy's really great, or this person's really great, or whatever the case may be. And you go there, and then if you go there, you may even say, well, you know, I, I heard it from one of your clients. And then you build a, repu a relationship and so on and so forth, and you get this authority. You, you, in other words, <clears throat> authority basically is you know what you're doing. You know what you're talking about. And um, there's other authorities that I tend to, uh, tend to disagree with or, or resist. Political authorities, perhaps, you know, if you get a speeding ticket, how can I fight this speeding ticket, you know? Uh, they have the authority to give me a ticket, but is there any way around it, whatever the case may be? Um, in this case, the authority that they're questioning Jesus on is his teaching. He's teaching, and they ask him specifically, where did you get this authority? What school did you go to? Because it's important to know what you're talking about. And if you don't go to school, that schools traditionally have been a recognized institution of authority. That's why none of you can be up here and preach, because you don't know what you're talking about. Well, I mean, you probably do. Point is, we have a system in place that recognizes that authority at least institutionally. And if you don't go through the institutional authority, then your authority as a particular minister or a teacher is not, um, is not given to the same extent. The irony of that is that the actual school that I did go to, the mansion that was donated to the Lutheran Church, is now going to be the very first Islamic college in America. Look it up. Yeah, uh, it's, it's an interesting authoritative thing. So now, they're questioning Jesus. Where'd you get it? Because he didn't go to school. We went to school, and if you go to school, not only do you get the recognition of the school, but you get all of the wonderful trappings. You get to wear a clergy shirt. And sometimes people really need that authority if they're, you know, conditioned as such. And why aren't you wearing the authority? Well, you know, it doesn't mean I don't know anything less about God. But, but, but we have this thing with authority, this relationship with authority. Because the last thing that we want to do is place somebody in an authoritative position over our lives that's not worthy of it. Right? It's, it's a horrible, it's just an, it's, it's one of the worst things in life is to have somebody that's in a position of authority over another person that has no business being there. It can be demoralizing, it can be, it's, it's, it's very frustrating. Have you ever had a teacher that was really bad? It's just, you just don't even want to do the class. 
Likewise, if you have a teacher that's really good, man, I can't wait to get to class because they know what they're talking about. And so you got this clash between, first of all, John the Baptist, who did not grow up, gaining the recognized authority of the Jewish leadership, but grew up in the prophetic authority, meaning he learned directly from God, if you will. And he came proclaiming and teaching initially the same message that Jesus would pick up, which is the kingdom of God. And everything that Jesus taught, remember, Jesus didn't teach scripture. I need to be very clear. We're very, we're very big on teaching scripture. It's very important. Big priority for me. Jesus did not teach scripture. Let that sink in. He taught the kingdom. See, you can know everything there is to know about scripture, all the Greek declensions and all the gram grammatical uh, things that come along with Scripture. If you know Hebrew and you know Greek and you all know all that, you can know Scripture and not have a clue about the kingdom, as is demonstrated in Jesus' life. And he would say, the reason why they hate me is because they don't know my Father. They don't know God. And the tragedy is they actually represent themselves as having authority of knowing God and therefore because we know God, we are able to teach you about God when in fact what they do know is the scriptures that bear witness to God but not God and the reality of God's kingdom. And this is the conflict that kept on coming in to, 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 to play between Jesus and those people that were working against him. He threatened, if you will, their sense of authority. And so, so they questioned him about this. And, he, of course, he asked about John. Well, what do you think about John? And, they, they, of course, if they don't know how to respond. Uh, if we respond this way, John, we can't really say that we don't agree with his authority, even though he didn't co go through the schools. And, and nowadays... Uh, um, and in many ways, if you want to influence people, you hit, whether it's politically or culturally, socially, you, you, you do it with the schools. You go into the schools. And schools then condition people to think a certain way. And so Jewish schools conditioned Jews to think a certain way. Jesus comes in and says, I'm teaching about the kingdom. It doesn't contrast. It actually fulfills what you're learning. But it's about the kingdom. And so Jesus knew what he was talking about regarding the kingdom of God. And the scriptures then simply validated the kingdom. But the kingdom itself, because of Jesus' knowledge about it and what is true about it, was able to be manifest in his life. And as such, <clears throat> people flocked to it. See, the kingdom of God is not about simply um, words, and teachings. It, it certainly includes that. But in, oh, that's why it's dark in here. We don't have any of the stage lighting. Does my complexion look different to you this morning? Doesn't have the blue hue that's normally up here. Thought something was off. Uh, going back to uh, what I was saying. The kingdom of God, as Jesus ushered into it, uh, had remarkable power. And one of the most the most remarkable power of the teaching was what we call reconciliation. Bringing people that, are, that have contempt or are prone to be malicious back together. Bringing God who we cannot see and because of our nature cannot know God back together in beautifully creative, intentional, glorious fellowship. With God, all things are possible. All, everything's possible. There's not one thing that's impossible with God. That's why Jesus can say, if you learn how to live from the kingdom, you can tell the mountain to go throw itself in the sea. 
It's a illustration, a demonstration of power. Not power as we understand worldly power, although power in and of itself is just power. Meaning that whatever I say, we all have our own kingdom, whatever I say happens, that's power. And generally speaking, the way in which we express power in this world varies to different degrees. One of them is money. If somebody has millions of dollars, they simply have more power. I can say things and desire things and buy things and execute my will in ways that people that don't have money can't. So if I've got money, I can exercise my power. If I've got persuasion, the, have you ever heard the power of persuasion, then I can, that means that I have influence over people's minds. Jesus came with a different power, an unlimited, creative, unending, beautiful, glorious power called the kingdom. So glorious that even in the midst of the most atrocious act of humanity, killing the creator of the universe, not only did, was Jesus killed, but he was brutally tortured. That power of the kingdom was at work. No one could see it, covered in fear, running away from their, for their lives, but it was at work, you see. And Jesus talks about this power of the kingdom repeatedly. It's hidden power. No one can see that power. That's why very few people pursue it. You can see other forms of power, and that's why people pursue it. People pursue money. People pursue fame. People pursue those aspects of power because as human beings, we are designed to execute power. We really are. We are designed and created with the intention of working with God to express in the most beautiful and creative way power. It's called love. This is love. Love is power. It's an unstoppable force. That's why Paul can say, what can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then he lists a whole bunch of things that are obstacles to power and says, no, I can't. Can this separate us? Can this? Can powers or principalities of this world? No, nothing can. Because God's power is greater than this world. But see, if it was obvious, people would be pursuing the kingdom of God. It's not obvious, it's hidden. So people go for the, the stuff that's obvious. You know, and Jesus says, "Well, I understand this is the way the world works, but if you, if you really were to know the value of the kingdom, you would seek it with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. You'd seek it, and if you do seek first the kingdom of God, all these things will be added to it. It doesn't detract from it, but." The kingdom, because of its value, should be seeked first. And as we seek the kingdom through Christ, through teaching, the limitless value of it becomes apparent in hidden ways, in very hidden ways. And that's why Jesus can say, when you begin to operate from the kingdom, when you begin to uh, live from the kingdom, when you begin to discover the beauty of the kingdom and the glory of the kingdom and the life that's in the kingdom, you literally become um, the salt of the world. Where you go in and, and salt is great when it's spread over you know, a great meal. You don't want a pile of salt on one part of your steak. Ruins it, you know. But you salt, and I'm, I'm kind of a salt freak, so I use a lot of salt. But you spread it around, and whatever the salt touches, it influences 
for the kingdom. So wherever you are. And see, the, the, the key that Jesus gives his disciples at the end of Matthew is go and be that influence. Don't just keep it among yourselves. It, 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 will, it will grow in its intensity. It will grow in its glory as you fellowship together, but you must go as salt goes and influence the entire world. And you'll start here in Jerusalem, and then, of course, you'll go to Judea and Samaria and the ends, the ends of the world. But it's like leaven, this power of the kingdom. You, don't put, you put leaven in, and, and, and you know, it doesn't just stay in this part of the loaf. It goes everywhere. And so this power uh, that comes from his, it's, it's, not, it's, it's, it's the kingdom, and Jesus, as he teaches us of the kingdom, uh, we begin to become aware of the kingdom. We become, uh, you know, awareness is the first step. If you're teaching anything, anything, awareness is the first step, right? You go down to basics, and you, you, you start with the vocabulary, Anything that you're teaching, you start with the vocabulary. This is called algebra. This is the elements, uh, periodic elements of the universe. This is called the C scale. You know, you start with basics. The kingdom of heaven is like, etc. And then once you have a vocabulary, then you learn how to, how to practice that and put it into practice. And this is what Jesus did for three years with his disciples. The kingdom of heaven, we're talking about, it's right here. How do I enter it through me? I'll teach you how to do it. Well, what's it like? Well, it's like a farmer that went out to grow seed. Oh. It's like, and he gives all these parables of what it's like. Seek it, pray, seek the Father, in every aspect of your life and you watch what will happen. And when you pray as you're seeking the kingdom, when you do pray, be like the woman who went to the judge and did not receive justice, but instead because of her persistence did not let the issue drop until something happened on her behalf. That's how you pray. Don't ever give up. And you'll find it. Because the seeking itself is transforming how you look at the world. Rather than reacting to the world, you seek the kingdom in the midst of the world. In prayer. And if you don't get it in the first 10 minutes of prayer, just keep praying and keep praying and keep praying and keep praying, and keep praying until something happens happens. And in the midst of that, you may feel frustrated. No, in the midst of it, you are going to feel frustrated. That's going to happen. However, the Father is good. The Father is good. The Father is such that there's not one bird that falls from the tree that God doesn't know about. And if you want to get even more precise, there's not one hair on your head that God doesn't know about. And God is good. You are so much more valuable than birds. You who live in a corrupt generation know how to give good gifts to your children. Right? You know how to do that. If your kid comes up and asks for a sandwich, you're not going to give him some poison. And if you, who are born into this evil world, know in the midst of this evilness how to give good gifts, how much more your Heavenly Father? Oh, don't be afraid. Your Father wants to give you this kingdom. He's prepared it for you and destined for you to reign with God before the world even began. See, that kind of teaching you don't get from a book. 
You have to know it. And Jesus knows it because of his relationship with his Father. Grew into a greater understanding of his Father as he grew up. And then, when it was time, began to teach in a way that was destined before the world was even brought into existence. See, this is really big stuff. And it's very difficult to keep our mind that big when we live in a world that tries to keep us this small. This small. It is. It's really difficult. Because so many things vie for our attention and demand our attention and have authority over our thoughts. Whatever you entertain is what you are giving authority to over your thoughts. Every time you turn on the news, you are giving that particular outlet authority over your thoughts. You must be aware of it. And bear in mind that whatever you're watching, any kind of media, I've been noticing, actually my whole life, it's, I don't know when it started, but my whole life throughout the entire um, time in which I was able to really partake in certain things, if you notice, religious people are always cast in a light of ignorant, judgmental, buffoons. Remember the, the big movie for me that's come around again is, um, it was big when I was in high school, is uh, the dancing one with Kevin Bacon. Footloose, remember that? Footloose. But do you remember John Lithgow was the pastor? He was just an idiot. He was cruel. He was a prude. He didn't know the father. I'm just going to make the kingdom by no one can dance. And that's how it's portrayed. But the kingdom of God is nothing like what it is portrayed by the world. It's completely different. It's glorious. And if people knew it, they would pursue it with all of their being. And so this authority that Jesus um, is confronted with by the re religious leadership is something that started from day one. And then he makes this profound comment. The prostitutes, because they were able, not able, but willing, they didn't have an investment in the old way of authority, primarily because they were left out. I mean, seriously. Yeah, we don't want prostitutes in church. Do you? I mean, if you do, let me know. It's a private thing, probably. That's a joke. Yeah, no, we don't. I don't. We want families, right? Hello? Is anyone awake here? We want families because remember when we started the church and there was 500 people in the Sunday school and we went in and remember that? Remember those days? That's what we want. We don't want thieves and we don't want people that have their pants hanging down their butts. And we don't want people that are doing drugs. We don't want that. We don't want people that don't smell good. I mean, I don't. And for the most part, we've done a good job of not making sure they're here. I mean, some of us might need a bath from time to time, but for the most part, we're pretty good. However, I don't think that's our intention in terms of God's intention. I think our intention is to be the salt. And as a salt, we go out. Generally to those places that typically, humanly speaking, we don't want to go. Places we don't want to go. And so Jesus says, the tax collectors, the people that you revile. And by the way, when he says tax collectors, there is a whole political thing going on there because tax collectors were Jews who worked on behalf of the Romans to exact taxes from their fellow Jews. So there they, they were looked upon as traitors and there was a whole political thing going on. And he says, you know, these political people that you hate, they're getting in. And the prostitutes, they're getting in. 
And not all of them. It's not like a blanket statement. They're all coming in. But people from these various groups that we would disassociate with, they're coming in. And they're coming in primarily because they're willing to listen to what I have to say and put it into practice. And they're actually entering the kingdom of God. And see, this is the beauty of it all. This is the glory of it all. Nobody has a marketplace on the kingdom except for Jesus. And so, my friends, as we continue to live out our lives, may we remember that we, individually and collectively, are that salt. We're that light. We're the people that... are bringing the influence of the kingdom of God wherever we go in the most natural and the most beautiful and the most perfect way. I had a great week and one of the kids I normally get to play tetherball with was gone. He moved. And when I saw the kids coming in for for uh, lunchtime. Lunches are not near as good as when I was a kid. They don't even have the... Do you remember doing cafeteria lunch where you took your tray and you emptied the tray? And then somebody was back there washing the tray. And then they put the tray in. Eh, it's all throwaway stuff. I miss it. But they came into the table and I said, Hey, how are you guys doing? I've been praying for you this last week. They didn't take notice. It was just okay. But that's salt. It's just salt. It's no big deal. It's not holy. It's not... Hang on a second, guys. <clears throat> Let me put on my... Oh, please stand. I've been praying for you. It's just, it's just natural. Salt is just natural. No matter what kind of salt shaker it comes in. It's just salt. Going to your neighbors. Hey, how you doing? I've been praying for you this last week. Nobody talks like that. If anything, hey, I was praying for you to drop dead. I hate your guts. You know, that's how we talk. But no, really, that's, yeah. You've just been in my prayers. Oh, it's just a very natural thing of the kingdom. And so as Jesus is, is, is continuing to this day, this, by the way, is salvation, being involved in what Jesus is doing right now, right here, May we remember that we have authority. We have authority. It's not worldly authority. But it's authority nonetheless. And it's a greater authority. So may this week, we move with greater sense of confidence. A greater sense of expectation. A greater sense of peace. Knowing that God is working through our lives in a way that ushers in the unlimited joy and peace and strength and life of his kingdom. And the great news, the good news, the exciting news, is that we get to be a part of it. No? Okay. I'll be like you guys. I know you're contemplating. My grandfather was like that, too. I really miss him. But when he'd think about something, he'd go like this. Good man. I want us to re redo our thinking for a second. We get to be a part of it. We're not victims. We get to be a part of something that for generations they've only longed to be a part of. Yeah, that's good stuff. Father, thank you for your grace and for your kindness, for your faithfulness. This is the feast of victory for our God. May we never forget that and as we go through our day-to-day -day 
struggles, activities. May your kingdom season it all. In your great name, amen.